Well, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Steve Patterson. Um, I'm the executive director of uh, MedVR. Uh, welcome to this uh, next uh, MedVR talk series, uh, augmented, reality, uh, augmented Reality and Total Knee uh, Arthroplasty. Um, it is uh, one of the more thorough studies I've, I've seen uh, in the area of, um, uh, of uh, uh, surgeon education. Uh, what, um, uh, what I think is important in the adoption of, of XR uh, is that, um, uh, that, that in the process of uh, uh, confirming and validating um, uh, people's work, uh, that, uh, that, that it maintains uh, some alignment with the tradition of, of, of how the, the field has done it. Uh, and this is very, very thorough, thorough so you'll, you'll enjoy the, uh, uh, the talk uh, for sure. Um, uh, we, uh, we give regular talks, they're focused on um, the journey of the um, uh, XR innovator uh, the purpose is to be uh, educational, uh, as we are an educational nonprofit in uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Um, uh, the um, uh, a couple of notes before I turn things over to the speakers, because that's what you're 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 here for. You'll notice at the bottom of your screen uh, that there is a Q and A chat and a regular chat. Uh, the Q&A chat is for questions, uh, so if you've got a burning question, uh, put it in the, in, in the Q&A chat um, and not in the, the regular chat. The chat's for the audience to speak with um, one another and to, to speak with the panelists, um, um, uh, but if you want to get a question in and get it answered, please, uh, please put it there. Uh, secondly, um, before we get started, I wanted to announce um, uh, one of our partners um, is, um, uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, take over the screen here for, for a second, James. Uh, you'll, uh, you can uh, grab it back as soon as I'm done. Um, uh, is the Medical uh, Augmented Reality Summer School of 2023 is um, accepting applications. It's a, a joint uh, project uh, between uh, Balgrest uh, University Hospital and the Technical University of Munich uh, takes place at, at Balgrest um, uh, in Switzerland. Um, uh, it, is, it has a wonderful faculty uh, at a uh, university uh, uh, teaching hospital with a, um, uh, a, a history of doing leading, leading ed edge uh, work. I will put the link in uh, so that in in the regular chat. Uh, so if you're interested in applying, uh, that you um, uh, you can access it um, um, and um, and and apply. I went two years ago. Uh, it was um, it it was really really Im impressive in terms of of what they produced. But I'll leave it to you to uh, to learn more uh, from the website and from contacting them. So uh, James, you can have the, uh, the screen back. So um, I'd like to introduce uh, Conrad Davis, um, uh, the, um, the moderator. Uh, he's a uh, pulmonary, pulmonary and critical care physician at Scripps uh, Clinic Medical Group uh, and a US Navy captain retired uh, he's done quite a bit of work in the field of, um, of uh, innovation, uh, both innovation with, with XR, uh, innovation in uh, learning, and innovation in, in crisis uh, response, responses. Um, uh, he um, uh, um, he uh, 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 has received awards for uh, his impact uh, and um, uh, is a, um, a national consultant of the Society of Critical Care uh, Medicine Fundamentals uh, 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 in um, in the U.S. Uh, he um, he holds the title of fellow in the American College of Chest Physicians uh, and fellow in the Society of Critical Care Medicine. 
Um, he's currently a clinical professor of medicine at the Division of Pulmonary and Critical Care Medicine at the Scripps Clinical Medical Group in, in San Diego. Uh, with that, I'll uh, turn things over to Conrad. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. So it's uh, really a pleasure to be able to uh, help with this talk. This is really uh, some wonderful research that I think everybody's going to enjoy hearing about. Uh, it's my distinct uh, uh, honor to introduce our two researcher uh, speakers today. And so first, uh, Ms. Anaya Kaka is originally from Mumbai, India. Uh, she is a medical student currently at the University College of London, and she's interested in orthopedic surgery, particularly the field of surgical education. She's, well, she's conducted and led multiple projects uh, in the field, winning numerous accolades including the Royal College of Surgeons England Intercalated Bachelor of Science degree in Surgery Award, as well as the Association of Surgeons and Training Prize for Best Presentation in Surgical Training or Research. Uh, as chair is the UCL Women in Surgery Committee and part of the British Orthopedic Medical Association. She has a passion for medical education and surgical training and is committed to increasing access and diversity uh, in the surgical field. Um, next, Dr. Uh, James Barnett <clears throat> studied medicine at the University of Manchester in 2012, uh, where he carried out a master's of research degree in tissue engineering and regenerative medicine. He entered basic surgical training in 2014, following his internship at the Royal Free London Hospitals and University College London Hospitals. He started residency uh, surgical training at the Royal National Orthopedic Hospital in Trauma and Orthopedics in 2017, and is currently uh, in his last year of specialist training. Dr. Barnett developed an interest in simulation uh, during his residency years, where he ran uh, numerous simulation training sessions and programs for orthopedic residents and registrars. Uh, this training included both low and high fidelity arthroscopy, virtual reality orthopedic procedures, and sawbone simulation. So without any further ado, um, uh, uh, James and Anaya, please take it away. So, um, thank you very much for that introduction, Conrad. It's, uh, it's uh, great to be here, and we're very excited to share this project with everyone. Um, and the project that we're speaking about is augmented reality in total knee arthroplasty. And particularly, we will be looking at our blinded randomized controlled trial that we carried out. Um, this is a project that we did at the Royal Free London Hospitals um, and, and, use, and University College London, and um, the, all the implants were provided by Zimmer Biomet. So I know that there's a variety of expertise in the room, some people more engineer based, some people more medically based, but I'll start at the basics in terms of the orthopedic side. And so osteo osteoarthritis of the knee, it's a, a common joint disorder. And it's predominantly due to wear and tear where the joint space narrows down, you get extra bone forming, and that leads to pain, which is one of the main um, morbidity associated with this. And it's increasing, there's more people who, are, who, who suffer from this, and this is largely due to our aging populations. And so the question is, you know, what, what can we do? And one of our main treatments that we have is a total knee arthroplasty. And that's really where you replace the joint surfaces. Where you have that damaged joint with extra bone forming, we take that off so that you have a smooth bearings, a, a smooth surface, and we put metal and plastic bearing parts. And that really reduces that pain. And the way that this is done and the way and the reason that we're talking about this procedure is because this is particularly what we look at um, in this project. We're looking at total knee replacements and with, and with the aim to, 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 do it, to, do it, to do it as well as we've always done it and also to improve on what we've done before um, when it comes to training. And this is a, an example on a sore bone. So there's a sore bone. Which is, a, which is a fake bone, which is used, and, and, and you can see there's an oscillating saw, which is used to make saw cuts. And the angles of these cuts are very important because as you can see from this image and this x-ray, if the cuts are wrong, if you it leads to poor alignment and poor alignment causes increased 
stresses on the bone and decreased wear and tear and poorer outcomes. And the demand for these procedures is set to grow. There's 70 in the UK, there's 70,000 carrying out per year. This is likely to be far higher in the United States and they're cost effective relative to the quality of life benefits that they bring. And they're very clinically effective as well. They lead to improved functional outcomes, reduced pain. And so patients by and large have a very good outcome. As well as that, they last a long time. 82% of these procedures last for more than 25 years. And we want to make sure that they last as long as possible. Because once you get to the end of that particular process, at the end of that 25 years or earlier, depending on when it's needed, you have to have a revision procedure. And these are expensive procedures. They have more complications and poorer outcomes. So we want to, we want to make sure that it's done properly the first time to, to avoid having that done until as late as possible. And now it brings us to surgical training. And surgical training has evolved over time. This is a picture from the 19th century, and, and I will speak a little bit about, more about that later. But it traditionally followed a, a, an approach where you would watch your mentors doing a procedure and learn from that. And we've come a long way from this, but not that much has changed. But we know that there are challenges in training. Pa uh, people have less operative experience. And this is because COVID, especially in the UK, that hits us quite hard. And there were, uh, operations were cancelled. There was less experience. There's also increased consultant leg care or uh, attending leg care which means that you have, because of the emphasis on patient safety, and therefore for that reason, again, trainees may not do as much as they may once have done. And so for these reasons, getting things right and making sure that we're bridging these gaps in training is important. And one of the ways that we've done this is to bring in orthopedic simulation days into our training. Um, into our training. So we've run a number of these simulation days where we will, where on our program, we have virtual reality headsets, um, used for femoral, for, for virtual, for femoral nailing. Um, we have, we, we have sawbone examples. You can see at the bottom here, there's a sawbone where you're using real implements and also haptic simulators where you can do arthroscopy and have, and practice doing these procedures in a safe environment. And sorry, just to mention that Mr. Patel, who, who was supervised the project, he's, that's him speaking at the beginning of one of these simulation days. And so that brings us to augmented reality. And this year we brought augmented reality in to try to replicate that operating environment further and try to, try to help to, 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 to improve the sawbone demonstrations of, these, uh, of, of the total knee arthroplasty procedures by superimposing and communicating between experts in the field and, and, uh, and, and with, uh, um, and, and with the trainer, trainee. So if I let Anaya speak from here. Um, so good morning. Uh, thank you, Jamie. So I'll just be taking you guys more in depth about our trial. So we had three main phases for our study. In the first phase, we conducted a literature review to survey existing papers on augmented reality for orthopedic training. Looking at the gaps in the literature, we then performed a pilot study to validate our methods and then finally conducted our main study, a randomized control trial looking at the effects of augmented reality on orthopedic training. For our literature review, sorry, I'm not able to share my screen. Um, for our literature review, we conducted a systematic search of three databases with search terms looking at augmented reality, education, and orthopedics. We found that although a wide range of procedures were studied, everything from pedicle screw replacement in spinal surgery to total hip replacements. Surprisingly, there were no studies looking at training for total knee arthroplasty. This is despite it being one of the most performed orthopedic surgeries. Additionally, the methodology of all the trials was not standardized and results weren't objective. In fact, out of the 13 studies analyzed, we had more than 30 different outcome measures. The most used ones were time and qualitative measures. Now, time isn't a very accurate measure of how well you perform a surgery. You can perform a surgery in 10 seconds, but is that actually going to help the patient? And qualitative measures, as we know, are very subjective and could be biased. And finally, most studies compared no training to augmented reality training, which is not a very fair comparison as it's not like for like. 
So we decided to create a blueprint that could be used to compare new generation training methods like augmented reality to conventional training. Our main aim for this was to create a methodology and an assessment that was objective, standardized, and reduce bias as much as possible. So for our pilot study, we recruited 20 medical students from seven UK universities and divided them to, into either in the intervention or the control. Um, I'll, go into more in, I'll go into more detail in the methods of the main study, but the main takeaway from our pilot study was that augmented reality significantly improved technical proficiency and knowledge of medical students compared to the control. Our outcome measures and assessments were valid and reproducible, and overall augmented reality was deemed a feasible option to teach medical students how to do knee replacements. Now, similarly for the main study, we recruited 17 orthopedic registrars or residents as you call them in the US in their first three years of training with no more than 20 TKAs as the primary surgeon and no, and no previous augmented reality experience. They were randomly allocated to either the intervention or the control. We performed a demographic analysis on them to ensure there was no significant difference between the groups in terms of skills or experience. And as you can see from the p-values in this chart, we had no significant difference between the groups, indicating that they both had similar levels of technical skill and experience in TKA. Now, moving on to our teaching methods. For the control, we used a traditional method of teaching by an orthopedic attending. He ran the participant sequentially on how to perform a TKA, focusing on technique, retractor placement, and how to attain accurate implant placement. He then performed the TKA in front of them using saw bones. For the intervention group, we used the remote assist tool on the Microsoft HoloLens. The participants wore the HoloLens and this would feed back their line of view to an orthopedic attending who was able to remotely provide instructions to the participants on how to perform a TKA using annotations and graphics, which the participants were able to see as holograms in front of them. Our three main aims of the study were number one, to find out if augmented re reality is equivalent to conventional training for technical proficiency and knowledge in TKA. Number two, whether it's equivalent for mechanical alignment in TKA training. And thirdly, we wanted to assess the validity. What are orthopedic residents' perceptions on using augmented reality for orthopedic education? So for technical proficiency, uh, so to assess these three aims, we had each participant individually perform a TKA on saw bones. They were assessed independently by two blinded orthopedic attendings on technical proficiency and mechanical alignment. So for technical proficiency, we first assessed non-specific items such as time and motion, knowledge of instruments, and the flow of the operation. We used the Objective Structured Assessment of Technical Skills Test, or the OSATs, for this. Now, this has been previously validated for TKA and is a reliable test for technical proficiency. Along with the OSAT score, we also developed a TKA-specific checklist, which was created using expert consensus and assessed specific items, such as how well the participants performed this distal femoral cut or if they confirmed rotational alignment. Next, we assessed mechanical alignment. So as Jamie mentioned, accurate alignment is one of the most Im important ways to improve clinical outcomes. Although there are different types of alignment, we use mechanical alignment as it is the most reported alignment parameter. It allows for a balanced load distribution between medial and lateral compartments, which minimizes wear and tear and component loosening. So to assess mechanical alignment, we use two angles, the lateral distal femoral angle and the medial proximal tibial angle. Both these angles are crucial in assessing mechanical alignment and contribute to the balance and loading of the joint. For both angles, we deem neutral alignment 87 and 90 degrees as the literature suggested. Finally, we wanted to assess validity and residents' perceptions on augmented reality for orthopedic education. So we used three types of validity for this, face, content, and transfer validity. Face validity was defined as the realism of the intervention as compared to an operating theater. Content validity was defined as the intervention's ability to teach TKA to the residents. Transfer validity was defined as the transfer of skills from the intervention to the assessment. So we found that the augmented reality group performed equivalently to the control group in the OSATS test and the task-specific checklist, as can be seen from the box plots, indicating that both systems were equally capable in teaching technical proficiency. However, the interquartile range for the augmented reality group is a lot smaller than the control, showing that augmented reality teaching is more precise, 
standardized, and there is less variability in the teaching. Now, in terms of alignment, for the medial proximal tibial angle, both groups were able to achieve neutral alignment. However, for the lateral distal femoral angle, or the LDFA, augmented reality was statistically superior, achieving significantly more neutral alignment. In terms of face validity, the residents deemed augmented reality as more realistic and more interactive than the control in terms of whether it was more real to an operating theater. And in terms of content validity, we found that augmented reality was as proficient in teaching the steps and anatomy for TKA and was significantly superior in teaching retractor placement. Additionally, the learning activity did translate to the practical assessment and augmented reality was deemed as significantly easier to understand, more enjoyable, helpful for preparation, and eight out of nine of the registrars rated augmented reality as five out of five. So we believe that the advantages of augmented reality are due to its ability to provide an immersive experience by overlaying annotations and graphics onto sawbones, allowing trainees to visualize the exact areas to make incisions. It also allows trainees to observe different angles of reference useful in learning accurate alignment. So you can see the photograph on the top right. That's from the Boston Museum of Fine Arts by Thomas Eakins, and it shows medical training in 1889. And as you can see from our photo in 2023, surgical training hasn't evolved that much. People are still craning their necks, trying to get a good view. And with augmented reality, we solve this problem. We have participants not only getting the best views, but also added arrows, graphics, x-rays, diagrams. Basically, we're only limited by an imagination on what they can um, assess. So just to discuss the limitations of the study, it was a small sample size. There's eight in one group, nine in the other group. There's also, we, although we were able to test the validity, the transfer validity we did on sawbones rather than actual humans or doing it on cadavers, but this is largely logistical issues around doing these types of projects. And the other thing is, it's a single assessment and, and ideally we'd want to test over a longer period of time how trainees improve because we want to see that it has a longer term benefit rather than as a one-off on a training day. But in summary, this is a study that demonstrates equivalent technical proficiency and improved or significantly improved mechanical alignment in orthopedic residents learning TKR with augmented reality and it was perceived as more enjoyable and useful than the conventional training and we can show that it's capable of teaching complex multi-step surgical procedures and so in terms of where we want to go from here it's really trying to expand this to try to um, do this on a more national level so that we have more data because I think what will really help to drive this forward and drive these types of projects forward is having data to show that it's effective and it makes a difference and the more data that we can take from this the more we can make a case for incorporating it into our surgical training programs and ultimately and the goal of everything we do really is patient outcomes and try to have the best patient outcomes and whether this then translates into patient outcomes is difficult to say because taking a medical student or, or a, a resident from from their training all the way into their final end result is, is difficult to actually assess that but this is something that really we want to see and then as well as that there are other uses of this technology it's there's as well as being used for this what we found is that it's it, it, there, there, there's uses for example with virtual training courses where you could have multiple people wearing headsets and watching the same display whilst someone is being demonstrated how to do a procedure. Or dual consultant or attending procedures where you have the expertise of another colleague where they may not be in the room with you, but they're able to comment and help with a procedure virtually. And in a similar, in a similar vein, you also have experts who might even be based abroad where perhaps they don't have the expertise, where they could also provide this same level of, um, of, of input. And so I think the reuse of this technology and validating this technology will help in a wide range of applications. Thank you very much. And also to those who helped us with the project, um, um, we, we uh, just wanted to acknowledge them as well. Okay, outstanding. That's, uh, we, we have several questions that are popping up here in our Q&A. So 
um, in no particular order here, if I might uh, um, pose some of these. Uh, we have one question, do you compare learning against virtual reality, which would seem to be a better option for a wider simulation? Um, so no, go on. Sorry, yeah, so we, have, we didn't look at specifically virtual reality. Um, it was more as an augmented reality um, that we more specifically looked at. And, and the learning that we did was a, a conventional learning session. It was a half an hour session with, a, with a, an attending who was leading that, that learning session and it was interactive. So it, the uh, participants were able to ask questions during that, uh, that, that demonstration. Um, yeah, just jumping on that. So we initially were planning to do it either on virtual reality or augmented reality. And we decided to do augmented reality in the end, because augmented reality, we feel captures the best of both worlds. So we have the virtual world, which we can include haptics, we can include uh, graphics onto the real world, which is the sawbones. So we thought augmented reality gives a merge of both virtual and real interactions. So that's why we went for that. And I think the point to stress to that question, too, is, you know, that the standard of the control was the old fashioned way of training, which is, you know, kind of see one, do one, teach one. Right. Yeah. That's uh, what we do in medicine. So um, it was the intervention versus kind of the standard or control. So the next question I have in our box here is um, how much time did you leave for initial understanding of how to use the XR platform? Um, and how did you do the training uh, for the uh, HoloLens? Um, so we gave each participant about 15 minutes to get used to the platform. And then they additionally got a half an hour training session on it. Um, so how we did the training was we had the sawbones and the participants wearing the HoloLens. The HoloLens would then feed back the participants line of view to an expert who was sitting remotely. And the expert could then see what the participant was seeing and take them through how to do the procedure, annotating things, adding diagrams, graphics, um, notes, arrows, anything up, which the participant could then see in front of them as holograms. Very good. Um, got another one here um, to either of you. It's uh, was the AR module built in house or outsourced? Did the doctors or medical students participate in building the AR module? Um, so no, so we just use the re remote assist tool, which comes on every HoloLens that you get. It's a standard issue. Um, and all the participants and um, the residents and the medical students were taken externally. So they had no affiliation to the project in any way, shape or form. Got it. Um, okay. Um, so just a couple other questions. Um, what do you, uh, having completed this study, what do you believe are the next steps uh, in terms of this work? Or what is the potential impact of this work, do you believe, uh, in kind of the wider field of surgical training in general? Thanks. I would say that the next steps of this technology are to firstly just try to roll it out more widely. We, we did it based in our more local um, area which is within the north london area and it, it and having more centers involved it gives us more data more to build on um to to work out how beneficial it is and the other thing is we did this as a one-off training day and but having said that using it as more of a regular occurrence where you could have um you know either kind of virtual reality headsets or augmented reality headsets to 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 to, to, to be using as in in general during the training would be quite helpful as well just so that that could be incorporated um, more day to day. Yeah and I think what would also be useful um, in the next steps would be doing a cost effectiveness study on augmented reality because as we know it is expensive. I think Apple just came out with their new product that cost in approximately 3,500 pounds or so. So making sure that the universities, hospitals are getting their money's worth with it. So I think that would be an interesting next step to do. Very good. And just, just in terms of funding, I was just going to say as well that in my experience, and it may be that this is, people have different experiences elsewhere, especially with the virtual reality headsets that I've used, the, um, often it's provided by implant companies who are demonstrating their technology. Um, and so we've used it as a way of training, but it's unlike a, a video game where you can make a mistake, where you can 
respawn or you see the results of things being done badly, there's only one set way to do things. So you learn the steps of a procedure, but you don't necessarily learn how to get it wrong. And that's for me at the moment, whether there's just <clears throat> general funding, which isn't there to get it to that commercial level of standard, like a video game. So I, th I think there's a lot more work that can be done to make, to, to make it really um, effective. Perfect. Um, we have another question. Um, so, and this actually, um, in, in my experience with the HoloLens, and, and admittedly the research I did was with the HoloLens first version, not the second version, but um, it had difficulty in this differentiating complex tissue planes um, in surgical fields. Um, and in surgical fields that were very bloody, it also had kind of uh, difficulty rendering um, annotations and objects that stayed fixed in the appropriate locations. So uh, the question from the group was, uh, what limitations did you find uh, in working with the HoloLens version two? So, so in, in terms of the HoloLens, the way that we used it, we didn't, I, I think there were some issues when, you know, if it's on, not on, yeah, as well as it could be, the you sometimes where you see the annotation forming might not entirely tally up with where the person is 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 putting it, and um, I think there were times when it could be a bit frustrating for the um, for the for the trainer and the trainee to to get that interaction right. Um, we didn't use it in terms of to, to help differentiate between tissue planes because it was just. The, the, the expert was there and could see the tissue planes and so could the participants. So I think in terms of from that point of view, there wasn't an issue. But generally with the pointing and how to do and, and how to overlay those images, I think that probably could improve. Yeah, and also another limitation I would say with the HoloLens is it taught us how to do the procedure just the procedure. There are a lot of other things that make a surgeon what a surgeon is. One of the main things being when to do op when to do surgery or when to not. So the HoloLens can't help you with decision making. It can't help you go on rounds and take our patients, get their history. It can't help you properly drape the patient, assess other things. So it can just teach you how to do the procedure well. So that may have been a limiting factor as well. Be very careful what you ask for in terms of application of AI or chat GPT or, you know, to the, uh, to some augmented reality platform. Uh, some of us may be out of jobs in the future. I don't know. Um, another question from the uh, chat here, was there a control group to evaluate um, a POV video like a wearable GoPro or a HoloLens with no overlay or holographic annotations? versus the HoloLens 2 with the holographic annotations like you use. Um, and the, the person that asked commented that uh, the current methods of training um, may include, and this is the, the kind of regular methods, old school methods of training may include like an overhead camera to provide better visibility uh, for those uh, observing the procedure. Uh, we, we didn't do that. And I think that's a it's a it's a good point really in terms of how much does this add compared to just using a gopro alone i think the benefit of this is that it's a more immersive technology it's not just the gopro it's also the fact that the participant can see the person who's giving them the um the, the training so you could actually see the person in your field of view and then and, and interact with them um and as as well as that it's more immersive, I think, for the person who's watching it. Um, so it would be interesting to have looked at that as well. Um, but no, we didn't do that. Very good. I think it also added a bit of interactivity. So we basically just wanted to try and see how good the HoloLens would be versus just normal training. So one of the main aims that we wanted to use it for was to insert graphics, was to insert x-rays, diagrams, annotations, notes onto the HoloLens. Uh, another interesting question here. So um, recognizing that you, of course, did use kind of a uh, manufacturer software and that kind of came with the device. Um, one of the participants is asking, have you uh, been connecting with other uh, sectors or other areas of industry 
uh, who are doing uh, simulation and training, like manufacturing, for example. Um, so interestingly enough, we have been in touch with an Australian company who are using holograms to teach medical students. Now, this is just medical students in general. Um, so that would be one of the next steps to actually develop our own software, our own code, and try and create holograms to teach medical students and surgical residents in a more immersive environment. Okay. Um, uh... Okay, from a business perspective, uh, how does this improve the ROI at the enterprise or institutional level? Um, and so I guess the question really is, uh, what would be the potential return on investment for using this sort of a technology? And recognizing we don't have precise or exact numbers, but you know, what would kind of be your reasoning through that question? My thought around this would be that making it commercially commercially viable is is going to be very important to bring this technology in in a bigger way just from our point of view we've shown that there's significance in terms of the benefits and and how well aligned it was compared to a conventional teaching process so we can see that um, and and that's largely because i think it's more immersive for for the, for the participant and the and 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 that communication was enhanced um and really we were looking I, I think at communication and, and improving that. I think another way to use it would be, as well as training, it would be also for having, uh, often we find that for very complicated procedures, there's a, it's helpful to have another consultant there, another attending in the room to, to be there to advise. And that's not always logistically possible. So having these kind of headsets around and available in hospital environments will, uh, I think would be a big future step to um, it, meaning people can work more flexibly in other locations and still collaborate. And I think this is what it could do as well, but to help with collaboration. Yeah, so minimizing travel time, potentially um, increasing the ability of people to uh, mentor or uh, provide second opinions or you know support um, safety and higher quality outcomes. All of those would seem to be uh, relevant. Um, so comment, very interesting exclamation. Um, have you thought about administering measures of spatial reasoning ability? Uh, published research shows that cognitive visualization skills are important in surgery and this seems like a very spatially oriented task. Collaborating with a cognitive scientist might help you develop a theory about how augmented reality is helping. For example, does it offload the process of doing spatial reasoning in your head? Does it act as a general cognitive prosthetic, et cetera? Wondering uh, if you have any theory about how the underlying cognitive processes uh, played out in this work. Well, I think we've lost uh, sound or hopefully that's not just me. I think, are you on mute, uh, Jamie? Hello, can you hear me there? Yes, we can hear you now. Oh, perfect. Yeah, I, I think it's a, a difficult. Um, so, so in terms of the um, cognitive side of things, the way that we use this technology was really to um, was really to help with having expert there for training. Um, now, it, it is a spatial task and knee replacement. I'm not sure whether the augmented reality changes the aspect that it's a, a spatial um it, it is it's a spatial task i think maybe virtual reality would be better for assessing that where you have a kind of a, a model a 3d model which you could do a knee replacement on and use that to assess uh, more spatially how the efficiency of movement looking to see the the quality of the cuts and all, all the all of the different steps of the procedure i think could be done really well with virtual reality where you have more haptic feedback the way that we did it, I don't think would look at that, but I'm sure there's loads of um, scope for looking at the cognitive processes and using it for assessments and how well people actually do the procedures. Very good. 
So just a comment from one of the participants, uh, just to, to point out that one of the most interesting points of this paper, uh, or a very interesting point, is that uh, there was a really a, a pretty exhaustive review um, of the literature to decide how to measure in this trial. And so uh, it's, uh, you know, worth pointing out. And for those participants, it's worth, you know, kind of reading the paper just for that reason alone to look at the kind of literature review, which um, I personally haven't seen uh, done before. So I think that was very helpful. And I agree with the comment. Um, I have another question slash comment um, about streaming the video from the HoloLens 2 from the uh, surgeon or proceduralist perspective to another screen, presumably for additional training. Um, so I guess the question is, can that be done? Could it be sent to other screens if other people wanted to monitor, observe, watch what was happening? Um, so interestingly, we're involved in a project doing exactly that. So we've just started another project. So we're using uh, two different things, actually. We're using a GoPro camera to live stream surgery, and we're also using the HoloLens and trying to compare between the two. So using the camera, you just see the surgery and you see the surgeon, and it doesn't hinder the surgeon's vision as much, and you can see it. But with a HoloLens, even though it is a bit more bulky for the surgeon and has to be sterilized, et cetera, uh, you, you can be a lot more interactive. So you can talk to the surgeon, you can add a bit, bit of things. And so we're just trying to, so that's our next step for our project. We're testing that out. Okay. Um, and then I have another question. Um, are you two interested in doing multi-site collaboration with future projects? Definitely would be. And I, th I think there's lots of scope for that. And we would hope to have um, run, would to run more simulation training days and have um, and try to incorporate these types of technology and technologies. And really, the aim is to make it better, make um, make the training better, so that we have better surgeons at the end of it. Um, again, careful what you ask for, but um, I'm going to uh, forward a question from the group here. Um, have you considered integrating AI to add extra input uh, to the uh, surgeon? I mean, it's difficult to know how to see that progressing. I mean, we haven't actually uh, thought about it in this project. But having said that, AI has huge potential, and especially if it's able to tell you how well the cut is being, the saw cut is being done to improve alignment. But, but having said that, there's already very good technology for alignment. So if that was the only goal, that there's robotic surgery, navigation, where you use infrared markers to help see where, um, where, where things are being placed. So whether or not it would actually be helpful, it's, it's hard to say, but I'm sure there's lots of use for it. I think yeah, where sorry. AI would be, oh, sorry, go on. Please go ahead, please. Um, I think where AI would be helpful uh, for medical students and surgical residents would be if you use them in conjunction with augmented reality holograms to create practice questions and practice practice data sets. So with the holo, holo lens, you could potentially project a patient with XYZ condition and then AI can make up sort of questions to ask you and go through that. So sort of a revision technology. Sure. W one can definitely imagine, um, you know, this technology being able to project or extend expertise, which is really kind of the nature of telemedicine in general. Um, traditional telemedicine has always been kind of, I'm just interacting with you in a two-dimensional fashion, whether it be over phone or uh, just, you know, uh, or audio video, um, which obviously is much increased during the pandemic. But with surgical uh, training or surgical expertise, you really need to be able to project three-dimensional um, knowledge and expertise. And so one can certainly imagine in the future being able to do that through this sort of a capability. Um, and then in a former life, I was in the military and, you know, they're very interested in how do we have that same expertise or capability projected in bandwidth limited, constrained or absent environments. And so some sort of autonomous or onboard AI that directs you through procedures one can well imagine that that could, you know, help stabilize, um, you know, a patient, whether they needed tourniquets placed or, you know, whatever the, the Roboa or whatever the procedure was to kind of keep them alive. Um, and so I know that um, different countries, um, you know, from that perspective, have a keen interest in applications or blending of uh, AI, machine vision, computer learning, and 
uh, mixed reality technology. Um, I have another comment. Um, so one of our participants did work with a mining company uh, and they had live feed uh, point of view uh, video from the HoloLens that was sent uh, live stream screening to uh, a Chromecast. Um, so yeah, I think we've definitely seen that sort of uh, application. Um, so another question, going back to the, the uh, question about return on investment, do you see this being expanded within the NHS or more broadly in other countries around the world? So yeah, I would definitely say that it can be used um, for that. So TKAs in particular are some of the best return on investment procedures in the NHS. I think they currently just cost about £2,000 um, per quality adjusted life year per patient, uh, whereas the NHS, the demand, I think the threshold is about 20000 So they are one of the most cost effective procedures and using AR technology in procedures like knee replacements, hip replacements can only increase uh, the quality of life and reduce the expenditure associated with it. And on that point as well, I think for these types of measures to be brought in it's just proving that they work and with very specific questions about what we're trying to achieve because there's always going to be people saying doing a, a normal conventional knee replacement if you can do that just as well why spend all the extra on the technology so i think the challenge is trying to make sure that it's relevant and actually it, it works and, and there's there's studies and data to prove that it works um, before we can actually bring it in, in a bigger way um, perhaps a related question uh, in terms of application or, or next steps or moving forward. Um, how else do you see this technology being used in the surgical field outside of perhaps just uh, knee arthroplasty or knee replacement? So uh, I think that yeah, I think that the ways that we would see it being used is it's. And, and this specific way that we've done it anyway, the, the way that I, I think this is, would be used is, is virtual courses. And it's kind of what we've been saying already, where you have a course where other people can watch the same screen that you're watching um, and, and try to learn from that and ask questions, annotate onto that surgeon's field of view. And it, and it might be, for example, you go and do a visiting fellowship in another country with a surgeon where they do a particular procedure that you don't do, but you are a very experienced surgeon and you only go for a week or a few days. And so you have the opportunity to, to see them do it there. And then later on, you go back home, you've got a similar patient, you want to do the same procedure and you can have that surgeon with you. And, and I think for me, that's where it can be very powerful and where there's commercial use within this type of technology. Okay, um, looking through here, the Q&A session, make sure we got all the questions. A comment that was just entered in the manufacturing space, it has been uh, shown that up to 80% of improvement in training, uh, in training applications with better retention long-term. So presumably we're talking about uh, application of AR technology. Um, yeah, the, the problem of how do you maintain um, or how do you train um, low volume, high risk or high importance skills is not unique to medicine, right? So let's say um, you service nuclear submarines or you service nuclear reactors but you are uh, in charge of very, one very small aspect of that and you travel the world to do so. Um, there are such niches uh, really throughout the world, I think in different areas of industry where you have extremely specialized people that uh, perform different types of maintenance on different uh, aspects of a very complex system. Um, and so I think from that perspective, I know that that's one of Microsoft's principal use cases in the remote expert um, functionality and, and having done uh, grant work with Microsoft many years ago when they were just developing the HoloLens, 
that's clearly something that they were thinking about. So that's a, a very good comment or very on cue uh, comment from the uh, chat bar. Um, we've got some links here that have been entered in the chat bar uh, for the uh, Balgrist uh, TUM Surgical AR Summer Camp in case anyone is interested. Um, we've also got, um, uh, that's a very long link. Um, for spatial thinking in medicine, including surgery, there's a reference that's provided as a starting point, um, which is a PDF. Appreciate uh, um, one of the participants entering that. Okay. Getting close to the uh, top of the hour, do we have, let's see if we have any other questions from our uh, group. Okay. Steve, back to you, I think. Yeah, well, wonderful. Uh, this was uh, a wonderful presentation. Uh, I want to thank Anaya and uh, James uh, for presenting it. Um, I, I, again, it's um, it's thorough, starting off with the literature uh, search on um, uh, and carrying through the um, uh, double-blind ra randomized study to come up with the. The, uh, the the assessment of um, of skills and 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 knowledge uh, too often uh, the um, uh, the the presentations of anything XR is always uh, 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 so spectacular that it does that they don't focus on the issues and uh, and in this case it was extremely important uh, and I think this is a wonderful template for um, uh, for, for organizations uh, uh, sim simulation labs and teaching organizations to use as a reference as they prepare to change methods um, and the, the, the beauty of, of this this work is um, it's methodically the same as something that that was um, a, a, a change in teaching, uh, that that happened before XR ever ever arrived, uh, which I think is important. And, um, in in the history of um, uh, of consumer electronics, doctors are always the first to adopt things like iPhones, iPads, iPods, uh, VHS. Going back back in time, um, but when they uh, when they leave home and and enter the the workspace. Uh, they are uh, suspicious, needless to say, of uh, of new technology and 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 how does it how does it help? Uh, how is it going to make make their uh, their work, their patients, uh, the outcomes uh, tur turn out better? Uh, and this uh, th this this talk very much um, uh, 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 encapsulizes uh, how to how to go go about about that, and it can be. Uh, it, it interpolated from uh, knee surgery to um, uh, uh, thoracic sur surgery, if, if if you're looking at um, at do doing that sim simulation. So, this is um, uh, th this has been been really wonderful. So, thank you again, and Conrad, thank you. Um, I really appreciated uh, your coming on on board. You've you've done things like this before. You uh, um, uh, and. Uh, uh, measured uh, uh, people people skill sets, and you've also been been on the in the role of innovator more than once. Uh, so it um, it makes your insights as a moderator very very useful. <clears throat> so I I, I um, uh, this talk will be up on our website within a week. Uh, if you'd like to um, uh, come back and and watch it or 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 share it with a friend. Uh, and on that note, I'm going to wrap it up and say thank you to the audience for attending and, and uh, look forward to um, seeing you again. <laughs>